right. Right. Welcome to week four of the Chinese Digital Pedagogy in Secondary School program. Um, look, I just hope you're all well out there. It's been a really disrupted week, and um, the video I'm actually uploading now is actually a, a summary of the presentation that we did in the Zoom session yesterday. Unfortunately, um, um, the Zoom download is, is stuck in the cloudware somewhere between Cairns and Townsville. I'm working from Cairns and, and the cloud is stored in Townsville, so there's a download problem and um, rather than leave it till Monday, I'm going to actually do a, a summary session and um, post that for you today. So please bear with me. Um, this has been an interesting week and Wendy begins the week by talking about the impact of, of digital media and digital characters and the, the life of, of um, the younger generation. Now, the current generation are what um, Mark Prinsky actually termed the digital natives. Um, and digital natives have actually grown up with this notion of digital technology um, and they're, they're pretty au fait with how to use this stuff. Um, and Prinsky actually explored this a lot in his, his work in 2005 and, and actually coined the two terms digital native and digital immigrants. Now, I'm in the age group where I'm definitely an immigrant. Um, I'm a boat person. I've come to technology later in life. Um, and when I began my teaching career, um, the technology class was actually a typing class. So it just goes to show how, how far technology has progressed in, in, uh, since 1987 when I began as a teacher. So it's a really interesting topic this week. Um, and what I'm going to do is present to you, um, rather than presenting a whole lot of different um, software options, Wendy's covered that beautifully in, in the uh, ebook for the week. I think what I need to present to you is the activities, the reflective activities, um, ultimately leading to reflective activity um, 4.3, which is your embedded task for this particular week. So let's get started. Let's have a look at that. Now, what we're talking about here is reflective image one. And this week begins with um, images. Now, images are actually a powerful tool. Um, as you can see, I've got an image here and I've deliberately um, posted that and I'm actually using the Creative Commons source here. You'll find the source to these images at the end of this um, um, PowerPoint slideshow. Um, these are not original images that I've created, but they're ones I've actually um, adopted and uh, um, added into my, my own presentation. So under Creative Commons license, which I'm able to do. So there's no point in reinventing the wheel, but um, these images actually capture beautifully what we, we're trying to achieve here. Um, and so when we look at the, the task for this week, we can see that you've got to write a blog reflection. Now you've actually got to do three of them and, and then ultimately you've got to do um, your final one, your embedded task. So you've got to look at the learning purpose behind using images. And here's an image, I want you to focus on it and actually see just how complex that is. I mean, that, actually, that image actually implies relationships. And this is the field of semiotics, we'll talk about that in a minute. The purpose of, of your reflection this week is to use images, visual representations created by others, and be um, learner-generated images and visuals. So reflect on them, think about it. Okay, there are there are principles associated with using images in your teaching. Um, one of the oldest is the the Park principle, which talks about proximity, um, alignment, redundancy, and and connection or, or 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 context. So when you put an image in it, it's got to have um, context, it's, it's, it's got to have proximity to what you're talking about. For instance, there's no point putting in uh, an image of a pork chop if you're talking about flowers. There's no proximity there to what you're talking about. Um, when we talk about um, alignment, um, you can see the image sits nicely to the left here, and then I've got two further images down on the bottom. So um, they're nicely aligned to the text because I'm going to explain a little bit about this reflective task in a minute, and I'm going to set up a continuum. So you can see I've got three images here that are going to interrelate. So that's what we call by alignment. Um, redundancy. Sometimes you see people putting up images and, and, and for that matter, videos too, which are just absolutely redundant that make people go through the hoops and, and look at all of these different tasks. And you'll find a lot of this in your mandatory training, for instance, when you join an organisation. Um, you go through all these silly hoops that you think, why am I doing this? I am losing the will to live. Um, images can have that impact on us. If you're using an image, um, you know, that, that has, that is redundant, that doesn't really need to be there, then you've got to question why you're using it. And the final thing is context. Um, the image must be, you know, relevant to the context of your discussion. And that brings us to reflection 4.1. How could you use images, visuals, visuals to be supportive of your learning in, in your teaching context? Using the SAMA model, you've got to explore how you can use images. 
Well, here's a really interesting notion of where we are at this course. We've engaged in collaboration. We've started a blog. We've actually, some of us have created a wiki and embedded a blog in that, you know, through Weedly. Um, we're getting into the aspect of creativity. There's a lot of creative ideas going on. When I look at um, the assessment for task 3.3, um, a lot of people are using the, the um, you know, the blogs um, very creatively and, and embedding some really, really good activities. And we can see the one thing, you know, probably that could, could ramp up in this program at the moment is communication, that we need to start talking to each other about how our blogs are working, about what we're doing with our blogs, because believe it or not, when you get to um, assessment task, um, your, your reflective summary, the 1500 word summary, it's actually going to ask you to include comments from your peers. So if you're sitting out there at the moment blogging and you're on your own, it's time to actually tap a few other bloggers on the shoulder and sort of say, hey, let's form a blog community. Let's comment on each other's posts. That way, when you come to your assessment item, you've actually got some input to place there. Now, in the middle of this image, we can see that collaboration, creativity and communication. We've got a little Venn diagram here. At the centre of it is the 21st century classroom. And above that, we've got our teachers and our teachers engaging in a whole range of behaviourist and constructive attitudes. Now, the behaviourists you find are predominantly older teachers, teachers who are trained in drill and practice techniques. Now, this is fine. This is absolutely fine for some technology. But bear in mind, if we go back to week two, we know that it's actually lower order thinking that we're promoting here. We're doing engaged in instructionism when we engage in behaviourist approaches. Constructivist approaches are those sort of raised by, by um, Lev Vygotsky back in 1921, where he talked about the zone of proximal development, you know, the ZPD. We need to get into a student zone. We need to use whatever skills we have as a teacher to work within that zone to create and, and, and set the conditions for learning. So my only issue there with constructivism is that Vygotsky is quoted as, as the captain of constructivism, but really Vygotsky is very old. Um, he published in 1921. It didn't reach Australia till 1970s. It didn't reach the Western world till 1970s. And think about what happened in Russia at that time. Um, they were going through through the, uh, the revolution, the cultural revolution, um, and the intelligentsia were being put to death. So Vygotsky's publications never made it out of Russia to the Western world, really, and, and until you know about the same time as Skinner and Maslow in around about the 1960s and 70s. So when we look at this, constructivism needs a shot in the arm. It, it, it needs, if you like... Um, it needs a steroid. And the steroid was given to constructivism by a guy called George Siemens in 2005. Now, Siemens coined this notion of connectivism. That is, what happens when we add technology to constructivism? And let's face it, most of our relationships in a learning environment these days, as Siemens points out, are networked. They're all based on technology. Every student you work with in a government system is on one school their record, their history, their photos, everything is based in that particular um, um, database. And from that database, their attendance, their progress, you know, their academic identity is all constructed. So we need to look at the impact of technology here. It's a powerful, powerful tool. Okay, we look at the constructivist notions here. Another um, researcher I'd like to bring to, to mind at this point is a Canadian by the name of Randall Pinkett, a P-I-N, uh, C-K-E-T-T. Now, Pinkett was um, actually wrote about the year 2000, 2003. He's still publishing. He works at Michigan Institute of Technology, MIT, which is the world's leading um, institute on, on digital learning. Now, Pinkett published quite a few pu uh, publications, and his principal theory was, was based on this notion of socio-constructivist constructivism. Now, that's a mouthful. Please don't try to say it while you're having your wheat bix but the reality is socio-cultural constructivism talks about the notion that we can actually work in a cultural framework. We can use Vygotsky's principles of a ZPD. We can work with pe people's culture as teachers, with an individual's culture as teachers or a subculture, for instance, Indigenous and Aboriginal students as teachers, and we can actually create um, patterns of, uh, of participation. We can create conditions of participation and learning. Um, so I really recommend two people to you. If you have the time, I know you're busy and I know you're cleaning up after cyclones,
but Randall Pinkett and George Siemens, Siemens in particular, 2005. I do recommend you have a look at Siemens. You'll come across him um, time and time again in, in, in the next 10 years. Um, he will actually define um, teaching and learning agendas. Um, all of this is predicated, this Venn diagram. Okay, we've got teachers, we've got theoretical frameworks, we've got low order, we've got high order, but all of this needs to be supported by an IT structure and an IT process. So we've got the internet, which Siemens would argue connects us all. We are all netizens. We belong in this global community of cyberspace. Then, however, cyberspace can be carved up into slices using the internet. For instance, if I work for CQU, there is a staff internet which students can't access. So I belong to the staff community within the internet of CQU, which is connected to the general internet of global, global relations. But I also need the skills to move around in there. And so there's a degree of learning that needs to take place here. I need the support to do it. Now, in this course, we're looking at blogs, wikis, and in week four, we've introduced media, general media. That is audio, video, and image files. Really the basis of presenting messages, presenting and constructing learning. So by this week, when we look at our reflective tasks, by Re Reflection 4.3, the embedded task, we're going to begin by telling me how teachers use digital media. In other words, just reflecting yourselves on how you use it, how you use the images, the audio and the video components in your teaching. Then, by Reflection 4.3, you have to consider how students use digital media. So you've got to come up with a model that will translate from you to the teacher. So we'll look at that as we go through. The next point I want to make is to introduce a notion called semiotics. Now, some of you may know this. I mean, I did my PhD in semiotics back in the year 2000, so, um, you know, it's as old as my white hair. But the notion is it goes back way beyond that. Um, it goes back to French philosophers. From French philosophers, it, it, you know, the, the, it got a rich history in research right throughout the 80s, 90s and 2000s and the noughties. But, but what it says is, is um, semiotics is actually a leading field in, uh, in our current um, frameworks, um, a, a, leading, a leading area of knowledge, a leading way of knowing. And, and semiotics is really built around this notion of signs, signifiers and connotations. So there's every sign, for instance, at a traffic light when someone flashes you a bird, it's really just a figure, finger. Um, and really fingers aren't that offensive. I've got you know, eight of my own and two thumbs and I don't really get that upset by them. But when someone pokes one at me, I actually feel signified. I actually feel that someone doesn't wish me well. Someone is actually sending me a message. And the connotation of that message is that, you know, for some reason, I'm annoying them. I'm in their space. I'm violating their, you know, the way their image of the world, their worldview, their discourse, if you like, or I'm tripping on their space or whatever. They're just having a bad day. But the reality is when we look at semiotics, you know, everything can be reduced to the level of a sign. And the sign equals the signifier over the signified. The sign is anything that gives a meaning. And the signifier is things that give meaning, for instance, a word or an image. And I go straight across here to this, this image here. We can sort of see how words and images are connected. An icon, you know, two unlikely looking icons. Um, you know, initially you would think space man, space woman, but we don't. We actually know they're signified as male and female. And the index to which they point, the index to which they point, uh, are these two trendy looking guys here. Okay, they've got a direct correlation in space and time with those things that they try to signify, male and female. Now, we don't even need that, we don't need that. We can actually reduce it to a global symbol. Anywhere, there's an arbitrary relation between the signifier and the signified, and we can reduce that to a single icon, a single symbol. And it gains meaning through social convention. So when we see that, we instantly think female. I instantly think um, yeah, feminist. When I see that, I see male. I instantly think male toilet, male bathroom. Um, it's got connotation. And it's what's evoked in the mind that creates the mental concept. Okay, and this is what De De Saussure sort of talked about with the image of language 
that language really is a series of mental images. A word is just a mental image. And of course, semiotics thrives on this. And therefore, when you put a mental image like Red Bull together, you can see the dynamics of semiotics at work. Let's look at that image. I mean, online, when we had this discussion, we talked about it in some, in some detail, but we've got two raging bulls charging at each other. So here we've got the notion of virality, you know, hyper masculinity, aggression, you know, this no stop, take no prisoners attitude. How do you get there? You drink this drink. Well, we know that's not real. Look at the text, red bull, huge, the color red, the red entices action. The red entices anger. The red entices emotion. And ultimately, down at the bottom of the page, we finally find out that it's just an energy drink. But it doesn't matter, because you and I are already into it. Yes, there's things we're raging about. We've got the connotation. There's things we're charging against that we can't change. Okay? There is this eternal world behind us, and we've got this constant conflict. And here we are in this masculinized, this primordial bull identity where we've lost all sense of reason and we're just charging at each other and charging at everything. Um, don't you want to buy a can of this? Don't you think this is going to get you, help get you through it? This is semiotics. This is the power of an image. Have a think about that. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. The next point I want to talk about is how teachers use digital media. And I've moved here to a wiki, but it could apply equally um, to the notion of, of, of a blog. Um, teachers and learners are engaged in this process of learning. Let's face it, we go to school, school is an institution, it's a process of exchange. It's the currency we use to actually um, talk to each other. So a teacher is going to have a wiki and a learner will also be involved in that wiki, or perhaps um, if the teacher is doing you know, some inventive stuff, the student will have a wiki of its own. But a teacher's wiki contains resources. You know, here's a video of how to do this lab experiment, etc., etc. Here's a video of this HPE exercise. Here is a video of a home ex economics activity. Okay, it's got examples. It will have exercises for the students to go through, and all of these will be constructed using audio, image, or video software. They'll be embedded. Now this week's reflection gets us to talk about what's new to you. What was new about using audio, images and video? How did you do it? How did you come up with a model that was going to create some solutions for your learners? In other words, how are you going to teach these people over here in the learners wiki to use and to navigate and to speak to this stuff? You'll find out some of them are better at it than you. Um, Emmett Rogers in 1995 talked about the innovation adaption curve. And he said basically that, you know, 4% of people are early adopters, they're innovators, they know what they're doing. Um, and then at the bottom, you've got about 16% uh, of people who are actually what we call laggards, people who will never take up technology. When you get into a school, you'll be able to identify who those people are. If your teacher is one of the early adapters or one of the adapters, you'll find them in the top 25 to 30% of people and they'll be doing some interesting stuff at least what they're able to do. But if you get placed with a, a school mentor who's in the lower, the laggard section, you're going to find, according to Emmett Rogers, that um, there's not going to be a lot happening in the technology field. So here is your chance to become really valuable to your teacher, to introduce them to new ways of teaching. So the Learners Wiki, and while the teacher's full of resources, the Learners Wiki is full of workspaces. While the teacher presents examples, the students are required to discuss those examples. Where the teacher sets exercises, the learner is required to uh, do quick Q&As, questions and answer sessions. And the learners are often, if the teacher's clever, divided up into groups, A, B, C. So they're not investigating the same thing. This is a jigsaw approach. So when a group comes together, a group A may be looking at one task, group B may be looking at another task, group C another. And then you go back to your blog where groups A, B and C present their findings. And this can be done in a range of ways. When I iPod, for instance, or I use a podcast, you can present lessons, interviews, summaries, reviews, updates. You can do screencasts of tutorials and software, for instance, how to create a blog in a screencast. 
You can do a slide cast, for instance, where you're introducing a concept. You may be introducing the art of, of Vincent van Gogh. You may be presenting photos and graphics of, of his seminal pieces. You may be producing reports if you're doing something in the business and accounting area. Science, bird watching, species orientation, species management, stories. Okay, if you're looking at you know, basically literacy, literacy in your own classroom. A vodcast. You can do role plays, discussions, projects, tutorials. You can actually present Shakespeare using your own groups of students in a vodcast. There is no limit to how you can apply this technology. How learners use digital media. And the reason why I present this is because um, this is part of your reflection, your embedded task for 4.3. They like to create digital reports. They like to record interviews, uh, audio interviews and, and project project summaries. They like to develop multimedia presentations and they like to produce video projects. Now, when we look at the applications, um, Wendy does a great summary of these. No matter what your subject discipline is, you can interview relatives. It can be about anything related to history. It can be about anything related to your, your contemporary English studies. It can be media studies. It can be anything that you want to introduce them to about their life history, science, the invention, um, new scientific discoveries. Okay, and you combine that audio interview with family photos in a video project. You know, here's Uncle Arthur, he thinks this. A radio drama based on historical events. You can record the show, complete with commercials. So, you know, this is bought, you know, uh, the, the history of the world, bought to you by uh, you know, Kennedy's Retrovision. You can learn about a different country by interviewing a recent traveller. They record the interview and then record a digital travel album. Great idea. Create a faux advertising campaign. Now, one of the best examples of this is one of my favourite shows, The Gruen Transfer, where they take two of Sydney's leading uh, advertising agencies and they give them the impossible topic, uh, something like obesity. And what they have to do is develop an advertising campaign to recruit people to obesity. Interesting. You could use it with your students. You can use audio video recording to interview sources for articles for a class newspaper, a class radio show, a class television program. You can write and record short stories, add music and sound effects. The teacher can record a tutorial that students can listen to on their own, particularly if you're doing a piece of analysis. It may be on global uh, warming. It may be some poetry. Okay, It may be a mathematical concept. Send it to them as a podcast. The teacher can record broadcasts and group discussions. So when you have a really you know, interesting class or you say to yourself, this is what we're going to do, here's the content or the knowledge component, I'm going to record it. And then I'll send it all to the students so they can go back and revisit that lesson. So I'm not constantly repeating myself. On a field trip, you can use an iPod or an iPad these days, it does the lot. Voice recorder, takes notes, digital camera to capture photos, even video. Okay, and then you can piece it all together using your video editor or in iMovie. So, Lots of great ideas there from Wendy for this week's applications. You may want to think about using those when you get to um, Reflective Task 4.3. George Siemens, I mentioned him earlier. And here's an example of how his theory of connectivism applies to wikis in education. So when we look at Siemens, we can see the model is kind of hierarchical here. And the reason why I'm presenting modules, uh, models um, is because you're Assessment task 4.3 this week asks you to come up with a model. Now, you notice I'm not using a lot of text this week. I'm primarily using images. Again, for those of you using images or, or exploring the image um, component or task this week, you may want to talk about images um, in, in your uh, reflective task. Um, again, you can see that images work just as well, probably even better in this environment than text. So what we've got here is a wiki module. And we know it's got resources, it's got exercises, examples and discussions. It's made up of collaborative teaching, okay, where the student is working with the teacher and with the groups. Okay, so the teacher's actually disseminating, saying, look at this resource, this resource will give, tell you this, here is an exercise, complete the Q&A, here are some examples of how this works in practice. Okay, let's discuss how this may operate at a general level. The learners may then be divided into groups A, B and C. And they may look at each of these resources, exercise examples, and discuss it 
from their A, B or C perspective. The workspace is where they actually start to do their work. Okay, the wiki becomes a project for them where they begin to build knowledge and share their knowledge. Okay, where they can actually post things, collect things, um, hyperlink, bring in sources, references, and ultimately they can blog. When they get to this stage where they're doing the discussion, they're presenting their final understandings and teasing out those understandings, they can do a blog. And the blog becomes a portfolio of their understanding. Now at this point, Seaman says, enter the external world, enter the network, the employer, the expert, the curriculum specialist, the scientist, the author, if you're doing something on English, the historian, if you're doing something historical. Enter the specialist. The specialist can then enter each of these blogs in their own identity, presenting a different perspective and therefore extending the knowledge of the group, connecting it to the real world. So what was originally a classroom exercise, including the teacher and the learner, has through digital media, the workspace and the blogs, become a vehicle, a pathway to a real world. Now this is the theory of connectivism, and that real world is embedded primarily, and for the rest of us, for the rest of our lives, in the workplace. So Siemens model stands the test of context. What works in the school will then carry the student through the rest of their life. And I want to point to something here too. I've got a little side note here. When you're using audio, um, have a look at what teachers generally do with audio. I mean, it's just a little wiki file. Um, and it can be done using any of the software, Audacity or, 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 or the voice software that Wendy recommends. Um, but here's what students do with it. They come up with a totally different image, a totally different perspective. Um, and even though it's the same medium, um, the message will look and feel entirely different. And you know, this is something we've got to allow for and something we've got to experience um, when we start to allow students to develop their own wikis in this environment or their own blogs. That, um, even though we have a common teacher blog where the discussion comes back, okay, it creates the portfolio, the understanding. Ultimately, students in their own student blogs, you know, yeah, you know, Batman may be the host, um, Catwoman, or a whole range of people, the Simpsons often figure, um, students will actually adopt different um, digital identities than a teacher will adopt. And that's really important to know. And of course, this is, you know, the principle behind a lot of um, policing of internet safety. Um, that students, you know, that, that people at risk, people, you know, pedophiles and people with, with malintent intent um, can actually adopt some of these identities and subvert these identities and connect with young people and providing and creating a great risk. So it's, it's quite an established science. Task 4.3 talks about a model and it's not hard to create a model. Here's an example. Um, this is about the digital image process and, and you know, Prezi, and a couple of people in, in the online lecture had actually talked about Prezi and having used it and, and um, uh, actually enjoyed using it. So if you haven't had a look at Prezi yet, it, it is a little bit time consuming. You've got to register, you've got to enroll, it's free. Um, but you know, to become a user, it does take a little bit of time to invest and learn how to use it. But it is probably, I would say, you know, five to seven times more powerful than, than PowerPoint as a presentation tool. But when you're looking at images, what's my model? Well, the first thing I do is I obtain my images, okay? And I can do a desktop edit of those images, and then I can post them to my slide presentation. Or I can do an online edit, okay? And I can post it to a digital report or a story. My slide presentation may be PowerPoint, it may be Prezi, it may be some other format, okay? If I post it into PowerPoint, I then go and locate PowerPoint's host player code, and it could be SlideShare, it could be a, a range of others. Um, SlideShare is one of my, my favourites. Um, but for instance, you go into SlideShare, it gives you the host player code, and all you do is embed that code in your blog or wiki, and it will play your images for you as a slideshow. You may, however, elect to do a photo story. And for instance, you may then go to Vimeo for that, and there's a range of software, actually, that will provide a photo story for you. There's Articulate. 
Camtasia is another one you can just load the, um, uh, photo stills into and it will create a video from all the uh, photo stills. And PowerPoint Slideshow will also do that too. Okay, and once you do that, all you need to do is embed your video host's player code into your blog or wiki. Now, there's a model. That addresses the question. What I would need to do now in, in you know, embedded task 4.3 is create some screenshots of me doing this. And then I would need to talk about how it addresses the needs of my learners and how it leads for me as a teacher into deeper understandings. So going back to week two, week one was the learner, week two, deeper understandings. And this week, I would need to present some, you know, some digital images, some evidence of how I'm doing that using this model. The digital audio process is the same. I can record and edit an MP3 file. And there's a range of ways of doing that. My favorite is Audacity. It's just something I used for many years. It's quite flexible. I have Audacity Portable, so I can just carry that on a USB stick. Um, and open up my um, my computer any time and just make a recording. Um, the question is, when I, I record it, am I going to do a podcast? Or am I simply going to upload a file? So if I'm going to do a podcast, yes, I upload load the podcast host. So in other words, I go something like Podomatic, for instance, and I get the player code and I embed it. If I'm not going to do a podcast, I simply look at the file, I upload load the file host. I get the file's player code and I embed that. So there's my simple model. I would then take a screenshot of me doing each of these things. And then I would talk about how audio, digital audio, can support the needs of my learners. And then I would also talk about how it will lead to deeper understandings in my particular curriculum area. I may also want to mention some of the issues and problems I had with resolving um, the application of this particular software, whether it was straightforward, whether it appeared simple and was more difficult than I thought, all those kinds of reflections are valuable too. So there's reflection 4.2 on podcasts. Write a reflection that documents your exploration of podcasting, pretty much the same as task 4.1, except it was images. 4.3 video, write a reflection that documents your exploration of video use and creation, pretty straightforward. With video, for instance, I will use um, Camtasia as my video editing module. I will generally shoot a video file. I will then convert it to an MP4. Um, if I make a file, for instance, in Zoom, it does an automatic conversion. If I do it from a, a webcam, um, I have to export that into Camtasia as a, a file. Um, and then I have to go through and record a Camtasia project, which I save as an MP4. Okay, so videos can be more complex, they can be more simple. But video, um, video files are generally huge. So I'd be cautious of some of the free stuff because it'll allow you to dabble and allow you to experiment, but it won't allow you to create a large video file. For instance, um, the Zoom session from last week was 403 megabytes raw. So that's a huge file. Now, there's very few free software that will allow you to actually convert that into an MP4 and then do the editing you need to do. Once I've edited it in Camtasia, I then save it, I download, I add music to it, I can do overlaps, I can do some screen savers, I can do rollovers, a whole range of things in there, and then I can simply post it to YouTube as an MP4 file on my YouTube channel. And we had some really good responses this week too. Um, Phoebe was talking about using images and as the focus of, of her um, embedded task 4.3 and provided some really, really good ideas there. And um, we also had T, who was talking about using a YouTube channel as the focus of her um, embedded task 4.3. So there's a lot of creative thinking going on out there. You know, make sure you're talking to each other on the blogs, um, because this is where primarily you're going to learn. The, the, the amount of software and the amount of flexibility around that software is just too much to discuss in, in one 45-minute um, recording. So embedded task 4.3. I really want to point to this because when we looked at um, embedded task 3.3, some people actually failed to read the task. The task actually said focus on blogs last week, and some of you did wikis. Um, some, you know, I actually had people go as broad as a learning management system, which is really an amalgam of, of blogs, wikis, discussion boards. Um, it's just far too big to discuss in six to 800 words. So 
So when do you set these tasks so they're realistic? So you've got to explore finding, creating and uploading to your blog, audio, video and image files. But note down here in the bold, select one of the three media, either images, audio or video, one of. Explore it further. Do not copy or repeat any information presented in your embedded reflections, that is 4.1, 4.2, etc. Link to them instead. So if you've already discussed, for instance, you're going to do images, link back to blog 4.1. Send me there, say, this is my initial response to using the image. Now, in this blog, I'm going to talk about its application. Okay, so take control of the blog. Don't simply repeat. Okay, it will be viewed negatively. Think about the nature of pedagogy and how high-level pedagogy could be supported through the use of multimedia by you, the teacher, but primarily by your students in creating media. Okay, so you know how are you going to connect this to the learners? Explore your technical features. How your selected media be created? How can it be shared? Is it uploadable? Where is it best stored? What sort of artifacts can you create? Present a model of technology to demonstrate your technical skill in using the tool. Okay, the little things I presented before on audio and image. Include evidence to support your technical skill. Screenshots. An example of a video that you may want to use and, and why you want to use it. An audio file you would use and why you may want to use it. It's one you may have created. Or external content that you want to link to, as I have done here with the, the Creative Commons um, images and sites that I've used for this presentation. We want to be sure that you can actually create and work with your nominated media, not merely talk about it. So what does this mean in practice? Here is my model. Here is how I would tackle a question like this. I would talk about me as the teacher, that I wanted to use this particular digital media, images, to assist my students to acquire knowledge, comprehend and apply that knowledge. How? I would put an image and I would explain what the situation was, what the class context was, what the knowledge, the comprehension and the, the application of that knowledge was. I would talk then about what the learners need to do. Analyze, synthesize, and evaluate information. So they want to use digital media to develop projects that, that will do those things. And in the middle sits my contributing model of oops, sorry. It's my contributing model of e-learning. And you can see from that model that I begin very much here as a teacher, where I present information to the students. I'm giving the discussions, resources, all those things we talked about earlier, embedded in my blog or wiki. I then send them off in groups. Group A has got to look at this, group B has got to explore this, group C has got to look at that. So they're working in their groups and they are blending course with contribution activities. So they're discussing stuff, they're team working, they're researching, they're analysing, they're breaking down concepts. And I'm moving from a situation of little or no human interaction where I just have resources a blog giving instructions, where the content is organised for instruction, where I'm giving pre-structured content with emerging now within the course. So the students are sort of saying, OK, I'm in group A, so we're looking at this. And all of a sudden, we're starting to see the course program grow. It's clearly got for each group, you know, this particular topic must at least have three parts because I've got a group A, B and C. What we're seeing here as we move towards the end of this continuum, Okay, is the students moving through this, this contribution of activities, ultimately to the stage where they've become Group A, the experts on Topic A. Group B, the community experts on Topic B. Group C, the experts on Topic C. So you could set up a blog activity now, for instance, where we've got co-constructed content and meaning, where Group A may decide to design a wiki or a blog around their particular student topic, where they're presenting topic A for dummies. Group B would do topic B for dummies. Group C, topic C for dummies. And what we've got here is knowledge building, reflection. And for each of those dummies sites, we would open them to discussion. And the discussion would come back in terms of portfolio understanding. Um, and we've gone from a situation here where we've had a series of random resources 
that have been converted by learning energy and input to lead ultimately to three discrete bodies of knowledge, which through technology are then integrated into a summary in the blog or wiki of our entire unit content. Now, I know that's vague. I know that's vague. But it could be science. It could be biological science. It could be divided into creatures at risk, creatures who are extinct, and living creatures, um, groups A, B, and C. They could then look, for instance, at isolating, you know, they may reduce it, for instance, to Australian marsupials, and look at each of those different groups from an Australian context. So we're starting to see a focus, contribution activities are defining knowledge here, creating um, some comprehension, and also applying that knowledge to a certain context. We then finish up with a group on, who are experts in extinct, a group on endangered and a group on current or existing species. We then can open up a blog on each of those different things and we can ask each group to swap shoes. Group A, comment on group B, group B, comment on group C, group C, comment on group A. We then have this professional knowledge building, sharing and reflection. Ultimately, we come back to a concluding task. What will you do? How will you use this model for your learning? The final point I want to make this week comes from Mark Prinsky. When we're learning through contribution and connection, we're changing the nature of the classroom. Prinsky talks about the digital natives and the traditional classroom works on conventional speed. There's a timetable, you've got five lessons a week, you've got so many minutes together, this is what you do. The digital classroom, however, works on Twitch speed. What do I need to know? How do I need to know it? Okay, let me go and find it. Now, the, 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 the traditional classroom is limited to the timetable. The, you know, the, the digital classroom goes way beyond the classroom walls and the classroom timetable. The traditional classroom is step by step, okay? Whereas the non-traditional classroom, the digital classroom, is actually full of randomness, okay? We have teachers initially teaching in the computer model. We have students co-learning to change the content, develop it and then co-contributing, sorry. And in the end, we have a co-learning community where you know experts in areas A, B and C are swapping information. We've got linear processing in the traditional class. And here we've just got processing. Processing at all levels, horizontal, vertical, internal, external, beyond time, beyond space. You can hyperlink back to something you wrote three weeks ago. You can hyperlink um, back to someone else's blog. You can suck knowledge in, you can include something into your framework that you have no claim over. You can actually say this is related because. So this is just a whole range of processing going on here. The traditional class is all about text first. Here is your unit description. Doesn't that turn students off? However, a graphic in a digital climate can produce so much more interest, such a, a, you know, a more colorful and dynamic and semiotic hook. Okay, you can present an image that can get people into your learning really, really quickly. The class, uh, traditional classroom is work oriented. Okay, let's do this. Okay, we have a curriculum, we've got a certain amount of time. It doesn't matter whether you understand it or not, we've got to get through it. Whereas, for instance, a digital classroom is largely play oriented. Let's get out there, let's tease this through, let's explore it, let's challenge it, let's become experts, let people ask us. It's all about intellectual play. And the traditional classroom is standalone, whereas this classroom, the missing link, is up here, George Siemens, it's connected. It's connected to the teacher, it's connected peer to peer, it's connected beyond peers to the brighter and, and, and bigger world. And what do they learn? In your reflection, think about it. Here are you know, probably close to 30, 30 skills that people learn, that learners learn through a digital environment, visual selection, multiple task processing, rule understanding, all things that we don't actually attribute to as intelligences. But if we look at Gardner's model of multiple intelligences, we can extend it way beyond Gardner. The use of symbols is an intelligence. What happens if you read a symbol wrong? If you go to a river and see a crocodile with its mouth open saying, Achtung, and you jump in thinking, beautiful, I'm gonna kiss a crocodile. Okay, you're in all sorts of trouble. So these are intelligences. And the digital media can actually help us learn those intelligence 
in so much more depth and detail. Thank you for listening. I apologise again um, for the tech fail. I'm currently in Cairns and having trouble downloading the account from Wow. So I've put together the summary, hopefully, to make up for the nature that I've been unable to.